Got it. Uh, so um, I had contact uh, the Rochester Curling Club because it seemed like um, they had posted on their webpage that they had done controlled melts and uh, Bob was willing to take this on. And at the same point, I had been in touch with Ian McCauley, who I met, I don't know, in 2010 or 11 at my level one. And he had been talking to me over beers after day one about the benefits of a controlled melt. And he's here to help us out. So uh, Bob's gonna do the bulk of the presentation. Uh, Ian will be here to do a little bit of a presentation and answer some questions. Ian may have to leave on some short notice, but uh, I think he'll be here for as long as he can. So Bob, why don't you go forth and uh, I'll just sit back and listen and I'll keep an eye on the chat. Hey, okay, great, thanks Russell. Thanks everybody for, for coming to the training. Um, I'm Bob Williams, I'm the head ice tech at Rochester Curling Club. Just really briefly about me, I've been head ice tech since April of 2019. I was on the ice crew before that and for, I don't know, a few years, but and some were sandwiched in the middle. I was helping out down in Potomac for a couple of years when I lived down in Washington. Um, in October 2019, I got my level two curling Canada certif ice certification. Um, not the USCA one, just sort of when you live in Rochester, you're you're closer to all that. It just just worked out that way. Um, so today we're going to talk about control melts and a quick overview. Um, th these are the the major topics we're going to cover. Um, you guys have already received the slides, so you've, you've already seen this. Um, this is what the Rochester Curling Club looks like. And I think the thing to say about this slide, and this is true of any uh, advanced ice maintenance technique, it's all about understanding the idiosyncrasies you're building. It's, all, it's hard to tell in this picture, and I'm going to get into great detail how the Rochester Curling Club works because so many of the decisions in the melt process have to do with your building. Um, but you, you probably can't tell from this picture, but sheets C and D are actually three inches higher than A and B. And so we're dealing with a lot of history and, and a lot of unique things. And every single one is gonna impact how you do the melt, but we're gonna cover every single one of those topics. So what is the melt? It's kind of like it sounds. We're trying to melt the top eighth inch or so of ice. Eighth inch, we will talk about uh, going forward, is kind of like your minimum melt at the, uh, you know, the last spot to melt. Some may melt more, and then the shape of the ice is like whether you've been dished or, or all these things are going to come into play in terms of how much water you actually have out there. But the point is, you're trying to melt the, from the top down using heaters. You're not trying to have your slab get warm or you're not trying to have your you're definitely not trying to have your paint float and we'll talk about all of the gotchas that can happen in a controlled melt if you're not careful so why do this instead of flood um, leveling is the same same reason you would melt the same reason you would flood pebbling and scraping a variable shapes the ice especially when you've got a boundary condition on one or all of your sheets as Rochester does. You saw that little center island. So every single one of our sheets has a hard boundary. And so our scraping patterns are a little bit limited. We can't overlap an out of bounds line or anything like that. Um, any curling club also over the course of a winter as the dew point drops, you're going to get sublimation, especially where air flows quite a bit, often your wall sheets, right? Um, another thing it does, in addition to you know, like you're trying to restore your level or your flatness, is all of the you know dirt, fibers, everything that makes your ice filthy that gets trapped under a layer of pebble or two layers of pebble, and then it's in there. You'll get this out, um, whereas a, a flood you're going to lock it in forever. And so another benefit is you're not adding to your ice thickness if you're worried about that. Um, we have a odd bumper condition. Our floorboards are very old. And at the end of our sheet C, you know, our, our bumper, C and D, our bumpers are lower than they ought to be in terms of like protecting the striking bands and protecting the stones. A and B, we don't have as much of that problem. But uh, 
we can't really afford to have the ice go any thicker or we're, you know somebody who's not careful is going to run a rock off the ice um there's other i mean there's some not there's reduced cost it's a little more nominal i mean when you're talking about mid-season flood you're only talking about a couple hundred gallons but it, it, it's a real thing and you're not taxing your purification whether that's di versus osmosis, whatever it happens to be um the no risk of freezing ridges bullet i believe that's like if you have a flood and you you miss a spot right and then you get that deep indent you probably see these when you're doing your install season and it's you know you can deal with it at install time because you're going to flood again tomorrow or later in the day you can't you don't really want to have to deal with it mid-season um the challenge is though it takes a lot longer it says longer it takes a lot longer um now, it, it depends a little bit on your capabilities, and Ian's going to talk about a way that doesn't take an impossible amount longer, but <laughs> the way we do it, it takes quite a bit. Um, and so this is time out of the club calendar that you have to negotiate, and we're going to talk all about that and, and you know how, what kind of agreements I've made with my board in terms of how often can we do this, how often can the, how long can the club be out, you know, which, which draws are impacted and you know how to prioritize that um when we say learning how your ice melts it's a challenge the first time you do this to see you know whether your ice is going to melt generally evenly you are trying to create this nice layer across the whole top but if you have cold spots in your ice shed or your heaters aren't directed to a certain spot or they are over directed to a certain spot or the air isn't circulated um this is what you're going to find to be difficult and what you'll have to learn to work with. Um, this next bullet, I, I would actually say, they're not the same as a flood. You need way more volunteer work, especially on the recovery end. Um, for this, in terms of you have a lot, well, I, I guess it's comparable. Like you may need to pebble and scrape more than when you flooded depending on how things refreeze. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the time is definitely spread over a longer period though. So you might be able to like not burden a, a couple people so much, but burden like your larger crew over the course of the weekend or something like that effect. Uh, rocks will run straighter. It, it's not so much straighter. Think about like the game when you're playing and so much of the game is to the center. You are going... If you come out of a, a melt and you had a, a dish before, if the reason you're melting is because you're trying to correct a dish, right? You're going to have a little more water now in the center. And when it freezes, it's going to expand. And now that's going to be your high spot. So now you're going to be peaked and you're going to have like, the, the people are going to say, oh, it's not curling. It's not curling. But that, that's what's going on there. And you can deal with that. And we'll talk about that when we talk about recovery after the refreeze. So a little more about our place and what we're dealing with, right? So we have this uninsulated concrete block shed from 1970. So as you might imagine, our dehumidifier doesn't work all that well. This place was really designed to be curled in from November to March. Um, and, and we you know struggle quite a bit in April and October. You saw in the early slide, that one with the college bond spill, we've got the four sheets, we've got the center walkway. Well, sheets A and B, underneath the ice look like they did in 1966 plus a whole pile of old paint laying around in, in between the sand grains what's left of the sand um the pipes are larger they're spaced wider um insulation is poor it's it's just a single layer and it's you know not much and so we deal with some issues of basically freezing into the earth over the course of a, a curling season on A and B. And I'll, and I'll talk about what the implications are later um, when I talk about you know, the way things melt. C and D now is built to the more modern standard. We have smaller pipes, smaller spacing between, double layer insulation, vapor barrier, all of that. Uh, we do have a decent ceiling despite the, the shed. So, And compressors, so we've got two the smaller one is supposed to lead, the second one is supposed to kick in for loading, especially during uh, you know, the early season and, and yeah, right after a melt, it's uh, compressor two is really gonna hammer. We run a variable speed brine pump. And so we can go up to 60 Hertz with that. 
in terms of pump speed. Uh, we run it a little lower, mostly to to save energy and kind of like let you know let heat transfer do its thing out there in the in the brine field. Um, our ice temperature is regulated by return brine. Um, basically, we'll we'll set our set point to something on the order of 22 degrees, and we don't uh, have a probe that it triggers from. In terms of ice temp, it's a little less sophisticated. It's a little more like we know how warm it is outside and just have, having done it a while, we changed that way. That's not, you know, <laughs> not ideal and not de definitely not recommended. And our dehumidifier is a long sheet A. And so the next slide here, so you can see our ductwork. And this is kind of an important point in terms of when we're you know running heaters. We have this big array of ductwork. The first two registers you see there are intakes. And then you see right around, like just past the well, past the Chinese flag, I guess. And there's one, two, three, four, five, I believe, uh, outflow registers. And we've got the same thing on the other side. On this side, though, we have an additional supplemental furnace in the back room behind the wall, and that's what that ugly uh, tubular ductwork is. The dehumidifier vent is actually behind that. It comes out of the the dehumidifier lives in a a room with the compressors, comes through a hole in the wall, hangs a left, and then runs along the wall down toward the Danish flag there where it sort of spits out. And so early in the season, we have better outcomes on sheet A than we do C and D where we might get drips off the ceiling if it's extra humid. So it's kind of what we're dealing with. And most of it is owing to the, the porousness of the block wall. Um, our air temp, typically 40. I think I have it set to 38 right now. Um, I described the heaters already. We've got those inline natural gas heaters and then a, a larger furnace outside of the shed. Basically that is supposed to like hold it to, I don't know, 35 or so. And then the inline ones are supposed to fine tune the difference when people are playing. We can set it to a way where it's only triggered when the lights are on. But lately I've been just running it all the time just for consistency of shed temperature. And our water is basic deionized, a lot of folks call it the Jedi system, but ours is not. We use a company called Aqua Sciences in Buffalo, and they just, as we request them, send us a carbon bed and a couple of mixed beds. So getting ready to do this, which is why you're all here. Um, first thing, obviously remove the stones. We're not trying to freeze them in. Um, and you want to check your perimeter like you would early in the season during install and make sure you don't have places for this uh, water layer to flow out. Hatches refers to that center island. So for years and years and years, we ran, we pulled up a hatch and ran the scraper through it um, to get from sheet B to sheet C. We don't do that this year because that hatch area was kind of filthy. And so we had somebody make us some nice ramps, but the hatch still exists. And so I use something like plumber's buddy because if, if I'm going to mess up in the melt and lose water somewhere, it's going to be from C to B through that. Um, and so just like a flood, remove your hacks, put in your pins. I don't know if anyone uses non-removable hacks anymore, but if you do, put in the cups. Um, center pins, however you do it. We, we don't really do anything with ours. We have this block with a, a set screw that goes up and down. Um, I guess if you have the flange, you, you would fill that in too, so you didn't have to drill it out later. And so when I talked earlier about top down, we kill our brine pump and that tells our compressor that it doesn't have suction and it, it turns itself off. So our whole plant goes off and then we jack our heaters up and we'll talk about what number, but we try to go as, as, as hot as we can. Um, the last time we did this, which was only about a month ago, we actually held pretty steady at 64 degree air temperature in the ice shed the entire time. Uh, dehumidifiers off or on, we turn ours off, especially if we're doing a melt in February and you've got really low air dew point to begin with because I'm not trying to evaporate and lose water. I mean, I'm not trying to add thickness, but I'm not trying to lose any either. Um, and a couple of warnings, you can't just turn off your compressors and leave your brine pumps on or you will melt from the bottom up. And if you have paint, that will migrate. One thing I should say is we don't have paint, and that may make this a little bit easier for us. We have those giant white vinyl sheets, four of them, 
and that's its own treat in April, let me tell you, but it's it's nice in September and it's nice for this because we never have to worry about our, our paint migrating. Um, the other way around, compressor on brine pumps off, which we're not even capable of. We actually turn off our plant for a melt by hitting stop on our brine pump and everything knows to shut down based on the, the control unit. But if, if this can happen at your club, it could be a really, really bad thing because you're just going to hammer and hammer and hammer your refrigerant and freeze your chiller. So as I said, shut off your plant, decide how you want to handle your dehumidifiers, turn on your ice shed heaters. The 48 to 55, I believe, comes from the OCA manual, the Ontario Curling Association. But um, as I was told originally, the first time I was ever told about this process by Don Powell, who's kind of a big shot up that way, just, you know, go as hard as you can, because the, the higher you do it, the more top melt you're going to get, you know, the less your brine's going to be impacted, the quicker you can get this whole thing done. Um, melt for a while. It is going to vary by club for all the reasons we're going to, I've talked about and going, and we'll continue to talk about, especially the placement of your heaters. Um, as an example, we, when we do this, we usually start after Thursday night league at 11 p.m. and kill everything. I come back in at eight in the morning, so that's nine hours, and see where my see where I haven't melted yet, and then um, I'll talk about what to do in that instance when you have a little bit of uneven melt. But generally, we're back on an hour or two after that, so we've gotten to the point where ours is about ten, ten to ten and a half hours. But again, it'll definitely vary. Monitor water depth. What we're saying is, you know see basically see how deep the water is and it doesn't have to be highly scientific like i just use my finger um and as i mentioned the heaters are going to determine what's going to melt first and the air just air circulation right so if you don't have this nice setup where you're blowing out heat all around your ice shed um for your typical heating and you have ceiling fans like if you have one of those high uh you know wood ceiling type clubs definitely turn those on to get some distribution um and, and as I said, at the very, very beginning, eighth inch of depth at the last place to melt is, is about right. You, you might be able to get away with a little bit less. Um, and so when you're doing this, especially when you're new to it, it's a good idea to monitor it like from a log standpoint. Um, because you're going to go and try and do it the next year and invariably you're going to, you're going to forget, you know, how long did we leave it off? You know, all these sorts of things. But note that, you know, the time of year is going to matter too. But it's nice to just know what you did the first time you tried it and maybe even the second time um, because this is a, a big learning process. And so uneven melt, we talked a little bit about fans. Um, the location is important, right? So you're trying to not just blast one area of the ice. I mean, the ceiling fan is ideal. A fan at ice level is going to push warm air toward a certain spot. So you either want tons and tons of ground level fans or you probably don't want to use that at all. Um, and once you're close to the correct depth, obviously turn them off. And, that, and that's a, a note for when you're about to start the refreeze. Not fully melted, when I get there at 8 a.m., and I see a certain high spot, um, I take the propane tank with the, the torch and basically hit the spots that need to be hit, just enough to kind of see them glass over. Because believe it or not, you'll come in after nine hours and some places on your ice will look pebbled. I mean, they'll be slippery as hell, but they'll still have like that, that textured look. Um, so this is not, uh, a picture from a melt, this is a picture from flooding at the beginning, but this is, it could be a picture from a melt. I use it to say, uh, regarding uneven melt, that the one spot with, without fail is the eight foot on that sheet B house. I have to come in and hit with the torch every time. I don't know if the air is just flowing around it or it's a really, really cold spot in the ground or what, but always have to hit that. And there, are, you know, any club's going to have those kind of idiosyncrasies. So you get your ice field or your, your, you know, your pad with the amount of water on it that 
that you like, you're comfortable with. So now turn off your heaters or put them back to normal. What I do is I actually uh, set them like 20 degrees down from where I would normally have them for leak play. Because you once you start refreezing, you don't want air flowing around in the ice shed. You, you want your water to sit as still as possible. Um, we have to turn on our brine pump first. If I clear my alarms and my compressor, it will do that thing that we talked about that was bad in terms of hammering and potentially freezing the chiller. So I, I just hit run on my brine pump. Eventually, everything wakes up. I return it to the normal settings. Like I don't try to put my set point extra low. There's no benefit in terms of speed of freezing to that because you're not going to make it to your set point by the time like your ice looks visually frozen anyway, right? So just go with what you normally have. You kind of do want to go slow as you can, just like your, you know, your final flood at the end of September to, to reach a level that you, you know, level, but not necessarily flat yet. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It will take longer to freeze than when you just did a flood for a couple of reasons. One, you your brine had probably warmed up a little bit. When I turn the plant back on and everything equalizes, my brine's more like 2930 instead of 19 to 21, like it is when it's all the way down to the set point. So you're not like adding a layer on a pad that's already like, you know, willing to accept a little bit of load. You're, you're starting from a much higher point and the whole thing has to come down together. On top of that, you've got a whole bunch of 65 degree air floating around your ice shed and you've got to pull the heat out of that too. So those are two important things to understand. My refreeze is generally take about eight or nine hours. I don't know. It, it can depend on, on the weather, but if you want to you know, get some work done that night. You really want to have your plant back on before 11 a.m., at least at our place. This is kind of what it looks like, and these pictures don't do it justice at all. Like, it is the nastiest crud in the world when you uh, first, you know, are completely refrozen. It's going to have this sheen to it, like you didn't use DI water when you <laughs> installed your ice, like so much junk is floating to the top. Um, the picture on the right is we, we had it happen to have a lot of snow here in Rochester in February. So when we dump our snow out the back door, that was the contrast on the whiter snow. But it's really nasty. And it's a fun one to send to your membership to remind them about, you know, what they wear out on the ice and the uh, quality of their gripper. You'll get more gripper bits out of this. What I find when my ice is generally dirty, it's more fibers. But like the gripper bits that get in there and buried under pebble, they're all going to come out in this thing. And so then you're sort of starting like you're starting at the end of September after your last leveling flood. Um, first scrapes will remove the snow with the impurities. So it is important to not use a blade you like. What, how we've generally made it work here is because we have four blades and we generally melt two or three times a year. It's twice this year because our season's a little shorter because of reduced membership after COVID. But if our season was a little longer, we would space three melts in there in our four blades. We'd make sure they're sharp at the beginning of the year. And the last thing those blades would do would be this initial cleanup scrape after a melt um, and pulling up that crud. And then maybe three more pebble scrape cycles after that. And then it's gonna be pretty shot and ready to be sharpened. And it's a good time then to, to switch to a sharp blade because the ice is pretty clean and now you're you're wrapping up that process. We try to get 12 in. Um, that counts the, the initial scrape of all the impurities off the top, which I don't pebble before. You also won't hit all the spots on your ice. Like that scrape is gonna give you very little snow volume, but it's gonna be utterly filthy. One thing to think about is where you drive your scraper tires. Like our scraper lives in a back room. We have to bring it down a ramp onto the ice. So like the very first thing I did was do a bunch of passes along that back wall so that I could run through the crap as little as possible, then turn around and start thinking about like a post-flood shaping pattern on the sheets. Because otherwise you'll be living with uh, just like this little, 
black crud on your scraper tires for weeks afterwards. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, and the 10 to 12 scrapes, like we start with our, our post flood, we probably do, you know, we have a sequence of three of those. We probably do that twice. So that's up to six, seven, if you count the crud. And then we go into our, our rotation of our regular patterns. And then we have to give it back, give the ice back to, you know, something that's programmed. And, and that uh, gets into this next point. You're, you're really closing the club when you do this. It says minimum of 36 hours. I think it's, I think the average is about 40, right? So we close Thursday night at 11. After that league, we cancel our Friday night open draw, which is just like pickup games. We cancel any, well, any morning rental that we might've had Saturday morning and maybe even an early afternoon one. And we try to get them the ice back for, <laughs> sadly, the first thing that goes on after this beautiful, after the ice is pristine is, is a rental at, you know, 4 p.m. on Saturday, but that's kind of how it goes. Um, and so what are all the volunteers needs? You're going to, what are the needs you're going to have for, you know, manpower, right? I generally Shanghai the Thursday night league, whoever played the late draw into helping me with snow, stone removal. Um, hack hole restoration actually takes a little more time. You've got, or we've got 32 hack pins that we've got to take out with the hot air gun and, and do the shaping on that. So that's not trivial. But uh, one thing to think about in terms of efficiency is if the ice is not completely frozen, but it has started to freeze around your hack holes, you can get started on that work before you're all done. And I've done that before, but then sometimes that's the last thing to, to uh, refreeze, especially if you torch that area, either before or during your melt to get a little more of the, the crud around the hacks out. Um, it may be one of the deeper spots in, in the last to freeze. And then your scraping crew. So I described, um, Closing Thursday at 11, if you're lucky, you can do something Friday evening. I had one time where, uh, because our heaters weren't working that well, I didn't get the plant back on until about 11, and a bunch of guys came in at 6, and they could have done something on A and B, but the scraper has to come out of the back door through C, and that was still completely wet, and so they had to just clean the rocks, turn around, and go home. And that gets to what you can do with this downtime. Um, it's a good time to consider retexturing your stones for the, the reasons I talked about earlier. If you had a dish, you will now have peak, and so you will need as much bite as you can possibly get coming out. Um, but you can also, if you don't think you need to sand your stones, like if you're confident in your ability to, to flatten everything out, still, you know, that's a great time for the, the camp fuel treatment and anything else you were thinking about, handle swaps, whatever it is. So when to do this, like how often in terms of your season? We're doing it every eight weeks. Uh, we have 19 draws a week. That consists of typically two a night, but then we take a lot of abuse on the weekend between rentals and junior programs, learn to curl programs, college kids, all that. Um, one of the big things, if you let it go too much longer than that, and this will again depend on your building, but our warm room glass, because the place is from 50 years ago, is single pane. And so, and our door for the curlers to come out is only on the side of sheet A. If we let this thing go to 10 weeks, I'll start to notice like significant draw time differences out and back on A, a little less so on B, and then maybe not as not really much at all on C or D, but it's definitely there, and it's really infuriating, and uh, you know, just something we can't deal with. Uh, how bad are we talking? Like if you play and you do the the back line to hog time, we're talking two tenths. It's pretty bad. Um, if you do hog to hog, it's probably a second. So we are proactive, and that last bolded bullet point is to that point. Earlier is better. Like don't wait until you have a problem. We know if we get 10 or more weeks, like we could try it, but we may start to have those kind of issues. Um, so be proactive with it. I've had my ice crew say to me, we'd be crazy to mess with our ice right now. And it's like, hey, look, one, it's when we can get it in the calendar. And two, let's not wait and find, like, wait till it's bad to uh, 
do some preventative maintenance. So this year, our ice was open for our first chance on October 1st. That was kind of tough because of our block wall. I think it was 85 degrees and outdoors and potentially foggy inside, or at least foggy early inside. So I'm going to push to change that in the future. But because October 1st is when it went in, we did our melt December, I think around the 9th, and we just did one about a month ago, something like February 4th. And so how, you know, how to schedule all that. We just talked about eight week intervals. Um, you think about your ice shape and then the biggest thing is the practicality, right? So this is an example of a spreadsheet I work off of. I'm looking at when all the draws are, you know, what week they're in of their session, where can we get them out? What are we trying to avoid? Like that bourbon and barbecue thing is a social event that for club members, but then there's also bond spills and all these things. So early January, our club had to shut down for two weeks because a whole bunch of people, myself included, tested positive for COVID. And uh, that kind of threw a wrench into things because I had planned this out to be to get me to the end of the year, right, right around that eight weeks. Now it's going to be 10 and I would have loved to have moved the melt a week later, but I was up against the bond spill. So one of those, you know, one of the things about this is doing the best you can with your board and with your calendar um, and, you know, fight for them in the summer because that's when you can lock them in. And so here's a whole nother approach. And I believe Ian is going to present this. Yes, Bob, very well done. Um, lots of great information just went through there. So I've been doing meltdowns for many years. I haven't flooded in a lot of years, probably 20 years. The first time I did a meltdown was by mis completely by mistake. Anyway, you learn by your mistakes all the way through. <clears throat> so we have a fair amount of curling on a day-to-day basis, and I don't have a lot of time to get from uh to do the maintenance so i have a burner burner that's a 14 foot burner so you just light that thing up and it, it burns the whole sheet back in the day we used to there's a motor on that thing we used to plug it in and go down the sheet and take about an hour and 15 minutes per sheet and we have all this water anyway after a few accidents of compressor accidents and we figured out how to do a meltdown uh, when I'm getting close to water on the ice, or it, you can do it at any point before water gets on the ice, when the ice gets slippy, when it's uh, 28, 29 degrees, I can take this burner, light it up, and uh, pull it down the ice, like uh, three minutes a sheet, four minutes a sheet, and do that once or twice, and then, and then let it melt. And depending how cold it is, and this particular building here is against block wall. The only insulation I have up there is wood and uh, it's built in the early 50s. So when it's cold outside, it's, it's hard to get the room heated up. If I didn't have the burner, I would not be able to do that when it's, when it's uh, mid, mid winter. Um, Another way you could do it, and it's faster. What you're adding water is you can get and do the same thing, same same approach as the meltdown. As soon as your heaters are starting to create water on the ice, grab the grab the hose and throw forty gallons of sheet on there. Uh, when you're doing that, I strongly suggest you put some uh, cleats on your feet, say breaking your neck your neck out there. Uh, the refreeze is absolutely identical with Bob. Uh, Bob's going to explain here in a few minutes. Um, and the scrape is, everything's the same. It's just a quicker way of doing it. And again, if you're, if you're adding water, you're adding ice. Um, if you can do that, giddy up. Um, a couple things I want to throw in there. Bob mentioned earlier, he takes a long time getting his pens out of uh, his hacks, using a torch, try Vaseline. Put some Vaseline on the pens, throw them in there, to, they'll pull right out. And the re-scrape after, the, after your, your uh, flood or melt or doesn't really matter what it is. I use a pretty big pebble head. I'm using a, either a 68 or 70 head. I want a nice sharp blade. 
uh, it saves a lot of work. You'll fill in the lows pretty quick. Yeah, I should have mentioned that we use a 72. That's the biggest we have. Um, yeah. But when you are starting, probably your first five or six cycles, you're going to want to use the biggest thing you got and then maybe go down to what you typically use before a scrape, which is for us is a 74. Yeah. Again, sharp blade, will you'll get there faster. Oh, one thing I meant to mention when I was talking about that topic, um, we made a mistake this last time. We put a new blade on and make sure your pebblers are your good pebblers that you've got on your cruise for your, uh, your scrape and pebble cycles after the melt. Um, we had a guy go pretty slow with that 72 and it, it's not a matter, it's like in his mind, maybe he thought we were filling in the lows faster. The reality was we were resetting the level for the, the scraper blade float. Then the reaction is, oh, well, maybe we should give it more turns and then you get stuck and no, forget it. It's a process. Pebble quickly, cut it. Pebble quickly again, cut it. It's going to take some time, but it'll give you a better result. Very, very good point, especially when you're using the big heads. You can yeah. get ice out of whack pretty quick. So, Bob, can we go back to the previous slide? Sure. And Ian, so can you talk a little bit about where you got this burner? And I mean, I know that uh, Kevin Mazden, I emailed him to see if he had heard of anybody down here in the States that had one. He thinks maybe there's one club that has one. But how did you come upon finding this burner? And it seems well, like... Back in the day, most clubs up in Canada had burners. And that's the only way they could really control their sheets because of um, the ice. There was no insulation underneath the sheets. Everybody had dividers. The, the ice was moving around, danced around like no tomorrow. So they'd actually burn once or once every week or once every 10 days. This particular club here, the ice maker back in the 70s, he literally, he burnt and vacuumed every week. He'd get a vacuum front cleaner in front of that thing and and uh, vacuum up the water. And that that's the way they done it in the seventies. So we had a lot of these burners up there, and uh, I learned how to use them quite a while ago, thirty years ago or so. And uh, I the biggest thing I had to learn is how to fix them and keep everything tight. So I just kept buying old stuff and making them. So I have three burners I could probably make up right now. And where do you get them? There's a company in Toronto that does sell them, but I'm not sure if they're in business now. They're getting close to not being in business. But I forget the name of the place. Anyway, they're a very useful tool. So this is really something out of the past that you continue to use. And then... How long does it take you to actually do your kind of burn, melt, melt, burn, flood? So I done one last night. Last night was a beautiful night up here to do that. It was probably 50 to 55 degrees outside during the day yesterday. It did get down to 32 at night or 34 or something like that at night. Uh, so I turned my plant off last night at just before nine o'clock before they went out on the ice. I always like to get the curlers to help me warm the ice up. So I turn the plant off before they start their game and it, uh, it just saves time. They don't know it's off. Ice gets really fast by the seventh to the eighth end and they love it. So anyway, uh, so that was last night. And then by 1.30, I got the burner out. No, it was 2.30. 2.30, I got the burner out and I did, um, Again, probably three or four minutes of sheet just to make it a little bit water, more or less taking the pebble off it. I put the burner away and I came back at uh, six o'clock or 6.30 and turned everything back on. I was ready to go. Okay. Um, hold on a second. So Gary White's got a question here. It says, I'm wondering why 
turn off compressor and brine pumps when the melt occurs from the top. I'm worried about melting from below and losing the white paint. By turning the brine pump off, there is no heat being created underneath. And if you can keep that slab at 30, last night I was at 31, I was on my instruments, it says 31. I know I can go to 32 on that instrument. Now, whether it's 32 or 30, who knows? But you gotta know your, going, gotta know your, uh, what your uh, numbers mean in your compressor room. So if your slab doesn't get above 30, and if you have a good paint job and you sealed it in properly in the fall, you're not gonna lose any paint. You could lose paint if you get salt in the ice during the season. But if that paint is put in properly in the fall and sealed properly in the fall, you're not gonna lose it. But if you don't seal it properly, you will lose it. The little trick I have with uh, the, the rings, when you paint rings, if not, not many paint, paint rings anymore, but when you're doing a melt, if you're doing melts, you could do just paint your rings, seal them in, and the next day come over, paint them again, seal them in, put two coats on, and you will not lose the paint on them rings when you do a meltdown. If you lose some, you're, it's not gonna be that bad. All right, Bob, why don't we continue on? And then I think we're gonna come back to Gary's question again as we move a little further down the line. here. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing about that. I know Gary's from Utica and that's a concrete floor. We're a sand base. And what I can say is doing it this way and not, and like Ian said, not letting the heat come from the bottom. Um, when we do restore our plant, our brine is not more than 29 or 30. Like, so t certainly time is of the essence. Like don't mess around too much with it. But uh, as long as you get it on in that window and, and melt well from the top down, you, you shouldn't lose paint because I don't think we had the vinyls the first time we tried this and, and we didn't lose paint. Okay. It's, it's been a while since I've been to Utica, but Utica used to have a, a, a probe in their slab. So you can, you can watch that probe and just make sure it doesn't get too warm when you're melting it. So if you've not done this before, what are the things to think about? So you might try in April to just prove the concept. Really, when I, when I say prove the concept, I mean test your heaters. That's what we did the first time. I wasn't even the head ice guy at the time, but we had you know heard about the technique and wanted to try it. So you know, after the last chance, turned off the plant and instead of just letting it meld over five days, we turned the heaters way up and then came back in the morning to see what it looked like. And we're like, hey, this, this could possibly work. Now it is different when you're in December. If you, if, if you decide the time you can do this is during that holiday break and you're in New York, it's totally going to be a different ball game in December. And it will be stressful, let me tell you, to like kill the plant for the first time and go home and go to bed. It, it's a tough thing. <laughs> um, once you've done it more than once, you, you sleep okay. Um, but that trying it out when you can't wreck anything is a good opportunity to learn and gives you a lot of room for error. But if you were going to try the refreeze end of it at the end of the season too, just to see what that's about. Um, just know that, you know, it may take longer depending on how well insulated your ice shed is. And so I think the biggest points for somebody thinking about doing this is just know your systems, know your building. That's been my theme since like the second slide, right? How good is your refrigeration in terms of, you know, how quick can you refreeze and how does that impact your calendar? Don't be afraid of your compressor and brine pump controls. I will say that prior to a few years ago, there was a prevailing sentiment in Rochester that you turned the compressor on in September and you didn't touch it again until April because what if it didn't come back on? But I mean, you just have to be able to do it. Like, just don't be afraid of it. it it's okay. Um, heaters are the big thing. Uh, I was asked when I went down to Pittsburgh in November if they could ever do this. They don't have heaters. I said, yeah, probably not. <laughs> it makes it really, really, really difficult because the number of them and location are so important. And we talked a little bit about fan circulation. Uh, when I was down at Potomac, I know they tried to do it 
and they didn't have heaters and they tried to use uh, space heaters and a number of air circulation fans. That one went sideways, but for kind of a different reason, but I'm just not sure how effective it was. I wasn't really around to see like how evenly did it melt, but I, I have to assume not, not that well. And they don't have a center island, right, where they could deploy heaters. That might be it heaters and fans. That's another thing if you have that to think about. Um, and, and what we were just talking about, right? If you overdo this, you, you will float your paint your, or your lines, like if they're yarn, if they're too close to the top, they might move. Um, I think the, I, I think more likely is you could lose seal around the perimeter, especially in corners, right? So when we shut everything down in April and you know, let it sit there for five days. And then all of a sudden there's not so much water on top of the ice. It's because it ran out the corners. So be careful with that. Like I said, plumber's putty is a great thing. It can fill in just about anything. Um, if you think your heaters are directed too much straight into the ice, like redirect your air or something that effect. So that, that's a thought. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of freezing too quickly, um, you may you probably are able to overcome it not freezing super level, but you know one thing we notice is you can after you do your first few scrapes uh, after the refreeze of a melt, you can see especially on AB maybe not even at all on CD you can see where the brine pumps are brine pipes are, um, so you know know your floor and how that usually freezes early in the season. Uh, we talked about a log earlier. So there's a lot of things you can put in your log. You can have it be as detailed as you want. You can talk about, okay, I, I put my set point here, or I, you know, this is when I turned off my heaters. I kind of do everything all at once, like the, you know, take the rocks off. I, I you know, I actually probably turn the heat on before I take the rocks off because you're not going to lose them in the first five minutes. Honestly, you're not going to notice that your ice is melting for a few hours. Like it, it it's one of those things where it's very gradually and then all at once. Like you notice the biggest gains in the last hour or two of your melt. Um, but you know, if you do do things in a, a certain way, log them all. Uh, map how your ice melts is a great idea. I just know it. I know what to expect when I walk in. It's going to either be like along that center island, there'll be some not melted spots. That spot in sheet B, maybe one on sheet C. But you'll learn it. And and these are. Definite first time considerations. And so final thoughts, they're a lot like opening thoughts and a lot like I just spoke about a couple slides ago. Know your system, um, know your building. And that's really the biggest thing. Uh, know your controls, be c confident with your controls. And then uh, it's a pretty good idea to like, you know, sit down with your ice crew after and see what they all thought about it. Um, we, hit, we were a club that flooded forever and ever and a lot of the ice crew was, was definitely converted to this just in terms of how clean the ice gets afterwards. Like if that's a priority, then a lot of people are going to like that, um, even if it's a little more pebble and scrape work afterward. And so, you know, based on what we've said today, consider like, is this a, a tool you think your club would be interested in? And so to totally wrap it up and, and start our question session, um, when I, we were first told about this, we had Don Powell come from Ontario to give us a, a seminar on best practices and scraping and pebbling and things like that. And he described this process. And he said at his club, the night before a melt, he opens it up to his membership for ice skating night. And, you know, all the jaws dropped on our ice crew. And this is not, this picture is not from April. This picture is from the day of a melt. One of the times I had one of my buddies on the ice crew and we, we shot the pucks around and really destroyed the place. But I mean, skate ruts, no problem. They all disappear by the time you come in in the morning. It's really a great thing. So a couple things come to mind. Um, one, Ian, can you talk a little bit about the issue around dehumidifiers on and off and when there might be a benefit to having them on compared to off? Uh, yes. Uh, for instance, last night, I have a mechanical D DMFR. And uh, you, can, you can grab some heat from that DMF DMFR while you're melting. I strongly suggest you turn it off while you're doing the refreeze. 
But if you have a mechanical dehumidifier, crank around there. It's more heat if you need more heat. Uh, if you have a desiccant, don't bother turning it on. It's not going to help you. But a mechanical one, there's a fair amount of heat thrown out there. So then Gary White had another follow up to the question he asked earlier. Is there any harm in uh, leaving the pad chilled and warming the top of the ice surface? That's what we're trying to do. Oh, you mean to leave the compressor on itself? Yeah. It's just going to take a lot more time. So that, happened, just... that, that happened to me by mistake one time. I was uh, putting a, doing an install. I was all done. And uh, it was hot in there. And uh, the compressor was running. Wasn't running properly. And uh, I was melting from the top. The, the, the compressor was still running, but it was melting on the top. It was pretty cool. But the, the compressor wasn't running at full. But man, oh man, it never make the ice nice. So you can do it, just take a lot, long time. So, go ahead, Gary. No, thank you. I just wanted to know if there was any harm in doing it. I, I didn't realize it would take longer. Well, if you're going to keep your slab at 26, it's going to, your slab has to get up, your slab's going to end up being 30, 29, 30, by the time you're, time you're, uh, you've got water in there. Okay. All right. I just wanted to know the rationale on it. That was, that was all. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions out there? So a couple of things that struck me about this was that uh, it definitely takes longer depending on your situation. It's certainly something that you could consider. It's working for Bob and Rochester. Um, they schedule it in. I think when we've talked about this, kind of preparing this, it's pretty clear that you definitely want to do a test drive. Bob's had an experience somewhere else where um, a test drive really would have helped. Um, the people weren't real clear about who was going to do what, when, and so things didn't quite work exactly the way they thought. So it's one of those things where you really do want to be very familiar with how all your systems work, how you can turn them on and off, how you can change the settings, and who's going to do what, when. Um, the big thing to me about this is partly that trying to do it um, frequently, earlier is better, so that you're not gonna end up in a situation where either you're melting or you're flooding and uh, you're gonna not be able to get your ice back quite to flat and level if you let your ice get too far out of way. So um, this is just another tool for people to consider using. Um, you know, as I said, I was kind of surprised that it took as long as it did to do it. But it's one of those things that if you get it in the calendar, it, it should work. So anything else that people want to add? Any other questions? or I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw out one more thing we probably never touched on. The low E ceilings. If you got a, the wrong belly and low E ceiling, you may not be able to melt. You can, if, unless you have a lot of heat. Them low E ceilings work the way they're supposed to work. I personally don't like them, but for meltdown, sometimes you, you need a lot of heat for a low E ceiling. In Bob's case, that low E ceiling, your ceiling's not very high and you have lots of heat. Away you go. I mean, in your building, Ian, that looks a lot similar to what the building looks like in broomstones and it seemed to me that in some ways you've got to heat up all that airspace up above there right yep and so in a building like that it might be a whole different piece of business than it might be in you know um peter sham or rochester or a place where you've got kind of a low ceiling and then the other thing is about the heaters and the location of heaters have a lot to do with where your ice is going to melt first and how long it's going to take you to get your ice to melt. Um, you know, broomstones, we originally had four heaters, one in each corner. Now I think there's two, one in the diagonals, although I think they have the same 
capacity is the four we had before. And you're gonna get a whole lot of different ice melt from that than you would have when we had the four heaters, one in each corner. So it's one of the things you have to kind of look at in your own building and then look at whatever else you've got going on that might affect your airflow. Ceiling fans help a lot. Put them on when you start, and make sure you turn them off before you start your refreeze, right? Yes. Especially in the higher, higher buildings, you can, with the, the ceiling fans on, you can lower your ceiling by a lot, like 20 feet. Any other questions from people? If there's not, then there's no point in us all sitting here looking at each other. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to see people and everything. But, okay. <laughs> so, but if there's anything else that anybody wants to add before we kind of take a break here, just uh, raise your hand or put the chat in. All right, well, listen, I just wanna thank Bob and Ian for pulling this together. Um, I hope everybody's found it informative. I have certainly learned a whole bunch about how people used to melt the ice years ago. Um, and uh, this will be the last training we're gonna do for dedicated ice people this year. Um, we'll sit down and evaluate what we're gonna do for going in the future. But I wanna thank you all for signing up. I have to say that there's an awful lot of people that curl on Mondays, about half the people that registered for this said that they weren't gonna be able to attend. And one of the things we need to think about is, you know, when we would do these going forward, because now that curling's back on, um, it's a lot harder to get, uh, provide this in an opportunity where everybody can participate and attend in real time. So thanks for signing up. And again, thanks to Ian and thanks to Bob and Dan, thank you for uh, taking care of the Zoom. So, so listen, everybody can go get a beer and uh, watch the, the evening draw in the briar. Thanks, Russell. All right. Thank you. Take care.